Hello, I'm Carl Horner at Shore Church. Uh, this is the weekend of April 5. You might be listening to this on Saturday, so I don't want to say it's necessarily Sunday, but uh, for me as I'm recording it, it is this morning, so good morning everyone. As I'm looking at the uh, sermon for this uh, weekend, I have entitled it Job Description, and it comes from uh, Matthew 16. And uh, I think in a lot of ways, it is a familiar passage, but I do think there's uh, got some different twists in it. When I'm, when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking Jesus is answering a question that I, I don't think anybody's necessarily asked, but the question he is answering is, why is Jesus here? And the answer then comes in his title uh, for himself. I mean, he's going to ask the disciples, who do you, people say I am? Who do you say I am? But I think the question really is, why is Jesus here? And the answer then comes in, in the title for himself and what the title, what the office entails. So it basically, it's going to be talking about a job description for Jesus. And then also in this passage then is the idea, why is there a church? Um, there are responsibilities or job description of the church in this passage, and then also job description for the followers of Jesus. So that's, uh, that's where I'm going uh, with this passage. The scripture is Matthew 16. It starts with verse 13 and goes to verse 23. I won't read that all at one shot. I'm going to start here with uh, verses 13 through 15, Matthew 16. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Now, um, as we look at this, uh, he asked the question, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And that Son of Man, that's Jesus' name for himself. Uh, basically, in, in all the New Testament, other people don't call him that, but Jesus uses that name for himself. So he's asking, so what other people say about me? You know, who do they say that I am? Um, and their, their answer, well, some say John the Baptist. Uh, and again, John the Baptist is well known at, at this point, you know, the idea would be that he's dead. So did he come back to life? And that's who Jesus is. Others say Elijah, you know, that's a prophet that was supposed to come before the Messiah comes. You know, we t- see that in other places in the scripture. Or Jeremiah, one of, the, one of the prophets. Now, Jesus doesn't say anything about those answers. He doesn't respond about any of those answers. But then he goes, so who do you say that I am? And then uh, the scripture, verse 16, Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So there's basically, there's about three titles here that I I do want to talk about. I'm going to talk about the the first title, which is Christ. It's a Greek word. It just means anointed one. Uh, Messiah is the Hebrew word. And it really, it, it is just the word that means anointed one. And so that ends up being a title for Jesus. He grabs that title. The idea was in the Old Testament, it talks about how God will send his Messiah, his anointed one. Okay. Um, In the Old Testament, the idea you always get is, oh, well, this this Messiah, this anointed one, he's going to come and save Israel. Okay, I mean, that's, that's generally what the whole idea that you ever see it in the Old Testament, that is the prophecies are out there about this Messiah. He's going to come and he's going to be God's anointed one who comes to save. Generally, it's Israel, but the idea is, you know, save the world. But, you know, Israel is the main emphasis in the Old Testament. And what I'm going to do in this passage, I'm going to jump down in this passage for a minute. Um, the passage is going to go on, and I will read that eventually. But as Jesus says, okay, wow, I'm the, you know, the disciples have said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he's going to tell Simon Peter, wow, great answer. So, so he accepts that. He is saying, yes, I am the Christ. 
Yes, I am the Son of the living God. Later in this passage, verse 21, he's, you know, he has just got done saying all this. And then here's verse 21. But from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Why does Jesus start talking about this? I mean, he hasn't been talking about this, you know, before. And, and as soon as he identifies himself as, yes, you're right, I am the Christ, he starts saying, well, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to have to go and suffer. And I'm going to, going to, uh, I have to go to Jerusalem. I have to suffer. I'm going to be killed. And then I'll be raised. Here's why Jesus starts talking about this. The job description for being God's anointed one is, I have to obey, I have to suffer, I have to die, and I have to be raised from the dead. He is giving them his job description. If you're going to say that I'm the Christ, and you're right, this is what the Christ must do. This is what God's anointed one must do. This is what God's Savior for the world must do. Must obey, suffer, die, be raised from the dead. It's interesting also then, um, in uh, one of Paul's letters to the Corinthians, he talks about, again, the function of Christ. You know, why did, why did Jesus come? Why, and, and he uses the, the title, Christ, because I think Paul understood we're talking about the title here, the anointed one. Why did the anointed one come? This comes from 2 Corinthians 5, it's 18 and 19. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Okay, Jesus' job description is reconciling all people back to God. And also then, the job description for us followers of God uh, followers of Jesus, it's ministry of reconciliation. We carry on the work that Jesus started. Okay, so all that's about what the, the title Christ entails and what that means. Now, I'm going to go, go back up to the start of the passage, uh, verse 16, where the other titles were Son of the Living God. So you've got Son of God. Earlier, this, this hasn't been talked about, that Jesus is the Son of God. Wow, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a bold statement that Peter makes. He is correct, and it's all about recognizing, and Jesus will talk about this in other places then, that Jesus and God are one. You know, my, my Father and I, you know, we're one. You know, uh, if you want to see the, the Father, look at me, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, yes, the Son of God. But it's not just the Son of God, it's the Son of the living God. So God is living. He's not distant and hiding off in some closet somewhere. Um, he's active, he's interactive, and he's grieving over his children, and he's grieving over those who don't know him yet. That's what it means for God to be the living God. He cares about people. I mean, that's why Jesus is here, to reconcile people back to, to, to him. But this also, as we start talking about the living God, and that's the title, you know, the son of the living God that Jesus takes, that starts talking about then our job description, our responsibility. So here, uh, back, back to the scripture, Jesus has just said um, that uh, the, the disciples, Peter has just said, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And then Jesus says, blessed are you. I mean, he's excited. You think, great answer, you know. Blessed are you, Simon's Bar Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. 
Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Uh, I think he tells them, tell no one that I'm the Christ because they didn't understand what this is going to mean yet and he didn't want to be hailed as the king. So he had a different idea of what, what Christ meant than, than they did. Okay, but, but back to this now, um, there's a name change going on here. Um, Peter's real name is Simon. Uh, lots of times the scripture says Simon Peter so that we know, you know which Simon it is and it's Peter. But Peter's name was Simon. And Jesus gives him a name change, and name change is often found in the Bible. You can find it all over in the, in the Old Testament. It happens in the New Testament, Paul and Saul. You know. Okay, Peter gets a name change. Um, in the Greek, his name is Petros. Okay, that's how you would say Peter, Petros. And rock, the Greek word for that is Petra. So Jesus, he's doing a play on words here, and he's saying, your name is not going to be Simon anymore. It's going to be Petros. And on this Petra, I will build my church. When he talks about building my church on the rock, the rock, it's a solid place to build. It means it's a firm foundation. He talks about how the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It means then that, that this church, it's going to be solid. It's going to be safe. It's going to be secure. It, evil cannot uh, go up against it. Fear cannot go up against it. Nothing can bring it down. He says, give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about access to the kingdom. And he starts talking about, you know, whatever's bound on earth and bound in heaven. In other words, he's just saying, you know what? If you're paying attention to what God's will is, then you'll be able to know what it is he wants the church to do. And then you set the guidelines for Wow, this is how God wants us to live. This is how God wants us to worship him. This is how God wants us to help the rest of the world. This is how God wants us to go about our job of reconciling the world back to him. So all of this is being talked about here. And this is a very big responsibility for Peter and also for us, for all of the followers of Jesus who come after Peter. This is a huge responsibility. We can't look at the world through human eyes. We must look at the world through the eyes of God. So, he's just said, Peter, you had a great answer, and here's the responsibility I'm giving you as a follower of me. And that goes for all of us. So, here, just looking at the passage then. So, how does Peter do with his, oh, he's got a new name. He's got these responsibilities. Look at the eyes of the world, look at the world through the eyes of God. That's his new responsibility. So how does Peter do with this? <laughs> well, when Jesus explains his job description, that's, that's what comes next when, when Jesus says, okay, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I've got to suffer. I've got to be killed. And then I've been raised on the third day. How does how does Peter respond to that? What does Peter say? Matthew 16, verse 22 and 23. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Okay. <laughs> Peter didn't do very well on his new assignment. You know, he wasn't looking at the situation through the eyes of God. He was looking at the situation through the human eyes. And it's like, eh, this is my friend. He can do all these miracles. He's not going to go and die. He's not going to go do this. It's ridiculous. Peter was failing his first test. Jesus is saying he will do whatever it is that God asks him to do. However difficult, however selfless, however scary. And that's what we have to do also. It is our responsibility to take on difficult situations, to take on difficult tasks, to take on difficult relationships, all for the sake of helping the world know about God's love. That is our task in life. The world is certainly in a scary situation right now. The world is certainly living in fear. You can see that all across the news broadcasts and everything going on. 
a lot of the world doesn't know that God is there, doesn't know that God is grieving alongside of us, doesn't know that God is wanting to embrace each of us. We mustn't only think of ourselves. We mustn't see the world through human eyes. We must see the world through God's eyes. How can we help? What is our responsibility during this time of crisis? And our responsibility is not to just hunker down and, well, you know, if I wait two months, everything's done. People need help right now. What are we doing to help people? What are we doing to help our neighbors? Um, there's a website, it's helpingnetwork.org, and it's a website that you can go to, and there's a place for you to volunteer. There's also a place if you need help, and so if, if you need help or your neighbors need help, you can certainly do that, or you can call the church too. But in this helpingnetwork.org, you can go there and you can volunteer to help out in your own neighborhood. Uh, maybe it's picking up somebody's groceries for them. Maybe it's getting things from the pharmacy. There's all kinds of ways that, that you can volunteer on there. And it only takes a couple minutes to do. I, I went on there and I was able to, to see what it was. It's very easy. And again, that's just one place that you can look to help. The point would be, what are we being asked to do in this time of crisis? How are we being Petra? How are we being the rock? the secure place that the church is built upon, the secure place where, hey, everybody knows that God is here and we reflect who God is and that God loves the world. There's another scripture that talks about the whole rock thing, and it comes out of 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5. As you come to him, and, and, and it's Jesus is called a living stone here. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a royal priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are the living stones that are being built up as a spiritual house. Let's let our sacrifices be acceptable to God. As uh, I end the sermon for today, um, I want to just talk a little bit about, uh, in the church calendar, this is the Sunday before Easter. You know, next Sunday is Easter. Uh, traditionally, that's the Palm Sunday or the Triumphal Entry Sunday. Uh, that's not the passage that I preach from. But I want to talk about what you can expect from us in, in the church over this next week. Um, Nick and I have looked at the passages that that talk about Jesus' last week of life, starting with today. And now he's got, he's got today and six other days. He's got, he, well, yeah, five of the days to live. So on this Sunday, this triumphal entry Sunday, there are scriptures that talk about that. And so this evening, uh, we will be releasing a, a video on the church YouTube channel that talks about those scriptures. And then tomorrow we have more scriptures and, and another video that talks about what happened on that day for Jesus. And we do that from Sunday through Saturday, seven different days, seven different five, six minute videos that talk about the scripture. Um, I invite you to pay attention to that, uh, log on each day by you know five in the evening or something like that, and uh, watch these videos. The, these videos will be released each evening. Uh, watch these videos. I think it will help you prepare for Easter Sunday. I know as Nick and I worked through these and looked at these scriptures and talked about them, I feel a lot more prepared myself because you can see where Jesus is the triumphal entry and that's day one. By day seven, it's the Sabbath and his torn and mangled, broken body is lying in the tomb and he's dead. And yet that's our savior. So I invite you to pay attention to that. Uh, today, definitely uh, leave uh, comments as you hear this sermon and there's thoughts that, that come to your mind. Uh, leave comments or leave ways you know that you can help out in the world and, and are there other things or 
if you leave some things that you know of that, that can be done, that you can do, maybe that helps somebody else be able to know that too. Uh, please bow with me in a prayer. Jesus, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one sent by God to save the world. Thank you for your obedience to God, and we want to mirror that obedience. And we want to mirror your sacrificial love, and we want to be able to help people be pointed back to God and be reconciled back to God and help us to be able to do that. And Jesus, thank you for being the son of the living God, the God who is interactive, that loves the world, that loves the world so much that he came in human form and died for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And help us not to live in fear, but to recognize what we can do to be faithful followers of you as we follow your mission in the world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless.